Okay, so I just wanted to uh, finish up uh, the uh, Rambam's discussion of the final issue about uh, Bechira, and that is the famous question of Hashem hardening Paro's heart and then punishing and bringing plagues on the Egyptians as a result of Paro's hardening of, of Hashem hardening Paro's heart. And the question is, the Rambam has made the argument, a uh, very logical argument, that it is not uh, just, it is not moral to punish people for decisions that they had no free will in making. And if Hashem overrid Paro's Bechira by not letting him send the Jewish people, how could there be punishment and Makos for that reason? So I had mentioned uh, two approaches, which is not yet the Rambam's approach. I had mentioned yesterday uh, two answers that are given to that question. Uh, the first is the uh, analogy to addiction or the analogy to a drunk driver uh, in which uh, since Hashem did not harden Pyro's heart till the second group of the five Makos and for the first group Pyro hardened his own heart so eventually he became addicted to sin so although it is true he did not have free will for the last five Makos but he and his nation will be accountable for putting themselves in that situation. Just as the drunk driver uh, certainly uh, was technically not responsible for what he did as a drunk, he was not able to control himself, he didn't know what he was doing, so why does he go to jail? He goes to jail because he put himself in that uh, situation by all of the different antecedent decisions that he made. So the same thing is here, right? So that's theory number one or uh, argument number one. Argument number two is the Maharal, that Hashem hardened Parosart does not mean Hashem overrid his free will, but rather it means Hashem made him less influenced by pressure that would normally break a person. So as a result, Paro had the unfettered autonomy to decide which way he wanted to go. So Fakert, Hashem hardening Paro's heart, did not take away his free will. It enhanced his free will by basically saying, you're on your own, you have to make the decision, you're not gonna be influenced by pressure. In other words, it is a gift somewhat, in some ways, that when HaKadosh Baruch Hu brings sorrows on us and it brings us to tshuva, even though that's not the highest level of tshuva, but it's a gift that uh, Hashem is allowing our will to be pushed in a certain direction, Hashem did not give Pyro that gift. But that's not taking away free will. It means Hashem didn't give Pyro the gift of uh, being influenced by this negative pressure. Okay, so now let's go to the Rambam's own view. Now, now this is going to sound somewhat like things we've been talking about, but, but it's important to understand that it, in fact, is a different shita somewhat. The Rambam says, we all know that uh, Hashem has a system of reward and punishment. And reward can take many forms. And punishment can take many forms, right? There is reward in Olam Hazeh, wealth, health, children, parnasa, shidduch, whatever it would be. And there are, or there's reward in Olam Haba, right? Reward can be here, reward can be there. The Iker reward is actually Olam Haba. The Rambam actually writes in Hilchas Tshuva, that all the good things that God gives you because you keep mitzvahs are not really the ultimate reward. They are there to create the conditions where you're able to do more mitzvahs. So really, the reward Hashem gives you is greater opportunity to earn more reward. Like that's what the Rambam says, that all reward in this world is in the nature of enhanced opportunity to be able to serve Hashem which of course you have free will not to do, but this is the opportunity Hashem is giving you. But whatever it is, sometimes it's this world, sometimes it's the next world, and punishment is the same thing. Punishment can take many, many forms. There's Gehenim, there's the purification process after you die, uh, there is uh, suffering in this world. So the Rambam says you can make a catalog of all the different ways a person might be punished. There might be death, there might be illness, there might be loss of function. Uh, there might be amputation. There could be a lot of things. Again, uh, be very careful here. The Rambam at this point is not telling me that that's the only reason why these things happen. The, the issue of why evil things happen to people is a vast topic, and we'll save that for another time. 
the Rambam is not suggesting every time a person is sick, every time a person suffers, it's because they're sinful. Okay? That's not where the Rambam is going. But the Rambam is saying that sometimes that is the reason. Sometimes, not always. And we're not, we're not going right now over all the other reasons. That is the book of Eov. And indeed, in the Mari Nebuchim, the Rambam himself <coughs> has a long discussion of the book of Eov. So don't be sidetracked by a very important question because I know as soon as you start talking about punishment for sin, people start thinking, oh, you mean my uncle was the biggest... I, 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 got, I got it, okay. I got it. We're not talking about that today. Okay, so don't get sidetracked with what intuitively and emotionally we automatically gravitate to. I, I get it. Uh, but the Rambam says sometimes these things are punishments for sin. That happens to be a fact. Now the Rambam says it is not within our ability to ascertain why Hashem chose one punishment mechanism over another punishment mechanism. Why somebody lost an arm and somebody got cancer. We don't know. HaKadosh Baruch Hu, in his wisdom chooses the appropriate atonement mechanism and we don't know why. So here's what the Rambam Shiddish is. The same way an Onesh for prior Avera can involve a loss of physical function, such as an arm, a leg, mobility, and the like, it can involve a forfeiture of a spiritual function. In other words, Bechira is a function, an ability, a capacity that our Kaddish Baruch Hu has implanted within the human personality. The ability to choose good or evil. But that is a faculty, the same way I can close my arm, the same way I can walk, the same way I can talk. I have a capacity of choice. So if Hashem could take away speech, hearing, mobility, as an onesh for Averos, Hashem may take away free will as an onesh for Averos. Now here too, the Rambam is going with the idea that the first five makos, this much is the same as the earlier thought, uh, the first five makos are Paro's volitional rebellion against God. The onesh that God decreed on Paro was the loss of the faculty of Bechira. Now, how is that an Onesh? Because that way, he loses the ability to do tshuva. Because the ability to do tshuva itself is a function of Bechira. When I don't have Bechira, I can't do tshuva. So here's the Rambam's point. Paro and the Mitzrayim are not this is where he departs from the addiction explanation, are not being punished for their refusal to send out the Jews where it says God hardened Pyro's heart. Rather, after the first five makos, God decreed that the Egyptians deserved a certain quanta of punishment. Right after the five, they deserved this amount of punishment that they eventually will get. But since if they would do tshuva, Hashem would not be able to give them that punishment because tshuva would be a kapara for them. So in order to ensure that they will get their punishment for their sin, which they earned and deserved by virtue of their rebellion, Hashem says, I will take away their ability to do tshuva. Now, you see what the Rambam is saying. So when they got punished after Makkah number six, after Makkah number seven, after Makkah number eight, after Makkah number nine, after Makkah number 10, they were not getting punished for their behavior in six, seven, eight, nine, ten. They were getting punished for their behavior in one, two, three, four, five. But Hashem took away the Bechira so they would not be able to do tshuva. And he says, and that is a punishment that God could decree on a person. God de de could decree on a person that your behavior was so evil that we are going to take away your capacity to do tshuva and as a result you will get the full punishment 
for your Averos, not the Averos you do when you lack free will. You will get full punishment for the Averos you committed when you had free will without the corrective mitigating circumstances of, 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 of tshuva, right? So again, the difference is under the addiction paradigm, the drug driver paradigm, Hashem is actually ma'anish you for six, seven, eight, nine, ten, 10, because the stuff you did when you were out of control is a product of the choices you made when you had control. The Rambam is not going with that, Mahalach. The Rambam is not saying you get punished for six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Rather, Hashem is preventing you from doing tshuva so that in six, seven, eight, nine, ten, you're getting the cumulative punishment that was already decreed for the first five makas as a result of the volitional choices that were made. And the Chiddush of the Rambam is that one of the own shim of HaKadosh Baruch Hu is to be maineya from a person, hold back from a person the darche hatshuva, so he will get his onesh without mitigation. Now, even then, there's a little bit of an ambiguity in, in, in what the Rambam means and really what the Chumash means. Does the Chumash mean that tshuva was impossible? That quite literally it would have been impossible for Paro or the Mitzrayim to go the other way? Or does it just mean that God made it hard? God created impediments, but had they strived uh, harder and harder? I mean, let me give you an example. In, in Perek Dalet of Hilchas Tshuva, uh, the Rambam enumerates, and this is really taken from the riff, the Rambam enumerates, nothing to do with Pyro, the Rambam enumerates 24 behaviors <coughs> that are ma'akei Satchuva, 24 behaviors that hold back the ability to do tshuva. Different types of behaviors, uh, cruelty, Lashon Hara, but the Rambam says at the end, a very important qualification, which the Rift does not say. Although literally, ma'akei shuva means hold back, hold, it holds back tshuva, which what, what might mean that tshuva is impossible. He says that's not what it means. It just means it's extra hard. It's more difficult. But if you persevere, uh, tshuva will be accepted. So I'm just wondering, if the same idea that the Rambam talks about when he enumerates the 24 behaviors that are Ma'akei V'satshuva might be similarly the case with Hashem hardening Paro's heart. He didn't make it impossible, but uh, he created personality blockages that are Monei a person from Tshuva. But again, again, the Rambam's point is Paro is certainly not being punished for what he did when he lost his free will capacity. He is getting punished only for what he did when he rebelled against Hashem with full free will. But the own shim that kept on going for Maka 6, 7, 8, 9, 10 were the predetermined own shim for the first five Makos as well. Uh, and Hashem took away, or at least made it very difficult for him to achieve a state of tshuva so that the own shim would not vanish through the atonement power of the tshuva that they would naturally come to do. The only question is, the Rambam then says, so why does Hashem play this game for five makos? I mean, if the Egyptians deserve this quantum of suffering because of the first five, so after the first five, just give them the whole shebang. <laughs> In other words, what is the point of Moshe demanding, let my people go? And Paro saying no when he has no choice to say yes and repeating that five times. Meaning that's another question. The first question is, what's the justice of pun punishing the Egyptians? So the Rambam's answer, two different questions. So the Rambam's answer to what is the justice is, the Egyptians are being punished for their behavior in Makkah 1 to 5. And the hardening of Paro's art simply takes away their ability to do tshuva, so they're not going to get the atonement for that punishment. And therefore, everything they got, all the suffering they got, is because of the first five makos. And of course, the pre maka behavior as well. The first five makos and all the behavior for the preceding 210 years. I don't, I don't, I don't just mean the makos, I mean the, the whole avdus and everything else. Now. There is a second question, which might be a secondary question, and that is, okay, I got you. 
uh, Hashem is not going to punish Paro or the Egyptians for whatever bad behavior they committed when they've lost the capacity of choice and everything is based on the pre-existing Averos. But the question is, why is God stretching out this game? God knows ahead of time that the game is they can't say, go, you know, leave even if they want to say it, right? They're not able to do it. Uh, so they're getting this punishment, that punishment, that punishment, that punishment. Okay, it's all connected to their misbehavior, the first five. But why doesn't Hashem just give it to them? Why is he stretching out playing this game in which everybody is like a puppet? So here the Rambam adds another point. It's a different question. And there's another point, and that is, once we've eliminated the fairness issue, meaning it is fair and moral for them to get punished, and now we're dealing with the timing and duration issue, Hashem does have a secondary point. And that is, Hashem wants to demonstrate to the Egyptians, to the world, and to the Jewish people, his ultimate control of humanity in the sense that they are just marionettes that Hashem can manipulate any way that he wants. And therefore, when you want to say yes, you won't be able to, etc. And Hashem is demonstrating over a protracted period of time his power, his control over the universe. Now again, it's important that you understand that you couldn't say this without the predicate of answer number one. Meaning to say, you couldn't just give an answer, oh, Hashem hardened power's heart to show that human beings are mari can be marionettes in the hand of God. But you'd still have the question, it's not fair, it's not just, it's not moral. Okay, it's important to understand, the Rambam's answer is a two-step answer. The morality of punishing people based on decisions where they didn't have free will, we have to say it is, they are not being punished for those deeds, they're being punished for their prior actions. And their onesh is, Hashem is monea from them, darchei atshuva. That addresses the moral issue. Because God is not going to turn you into a marionette unless it is moral and just and fair for God to make that decision. So that's why we need the first part of the Rambam. The second part of the Rambam is saying, why is Hashem stretching it out for six months as a game? The answer is that's exactly the point. Once it is fair that the Egyptians get what they get, the question of why it's stretched out is precisely because Hashem wants to demonstrate his total control. It's not simply, you know, if Hashem would simply like make an atom bomb and wipe them out, okay, that's a one-time event. But there's something much more poignant in the fact that every single day, every single move, every time you want to make a decision, you're just unable to make that decision. That shows Hashem's total control over the human being. And that's the important lesson that the Egyptians had to see, that they were powerless uh, in the face of HaKadosh Baruch Hu's Gezeros, and uh, B'nai Yisrael needed to understand it, because that is what prepared us for Matan Torah. Like, you know, why do I have to listen to God? Why do I have to accept God's Torah? Because you saw Hashem's power and might. And then, of course, you can transition into love and gratitude and all those other elements. But the foundation has to be the recognition of HaKadosh Baruch Hu's omnipotence, his all-powerfulness. And therefore, the Rambam says that this is the esod of Hashem hardening Paro's heart. And indeed, the truth of the matter is, the Rambam's idea, at least the second idea, is mamash beferish in the Torah itself. How does Parshas Bo begin? Parshas Bo. Uh, Bo el Paro, Go to Paro, even though ki ani yichbadati eslibo v'eslibo v'adav, I hardened his heart and the hearts of his servants, meaning his people. So it's not just Paro's whose heart was hardened. All of Mitzrayim. Why am I hardening their heart? Laman shisi ososai ela bekirba. To give me the opportunity to demonstrate my miracles and my power. That's what the Chumash says, and that's what the Rambam says. The Rambam is essentially, 
just going over the Pasuk. But the Rambam's point is, okay, and again, I'm, forgive me for repeating this, you don't get to that point unless you still, you first establish the essential fairness of this type of punishment, and that's predicated on the notion that the first five makos, as well as the slavery as a whole, uh, were a function of free will. And that was the Rambam's earlier point. Hashem never decreed that the Egyptians enslave the Jewish people. And as a result, the onesh here is not for the sins you commit when you don't have free will. It is simply for the sins you committed when you had free will, but Hashem is moneya from you, the darche yatshuva, both as a punishment and then as a mechanism to establish his power, power over you. Uh, so this is the Rambam's approach. Uh, he was um, somewhat proud of this approach. He even says, uh, other people say other things and uh, compare what I said to others and uh, you will surely see what is the correct answer to this very difficult uh, problem. So the Rambam, I don't want to say boasted, but the Rambam was uh, proud of the analysis uh, that was offered uh, in the uh, in the Shemona Prakma. Okay, so basically we, more, more or less, I, I have a few more comments about Bechira, but this is more or less uh, Perek Ches, the last chapter of the Rambam's uh, Shemona Prakim. Uh, now let me go over one kind of, it's not a side point, it's a very important point, but it's not a point that the Rambam discusses. So it's really, a, it's a digression from the text of the Rambam, although it's an extremely important point. When the Rambam discusses Bechira, in Hilchais Tshuva, in particular, the Rambam uh, puts it at a very high level. He actually says every single person has the capacity to be as righteous as Moshe Rabbeinu. Now, that's a tall order. As righteous as Moshe Rabbeinu or as evil as Yeravam ben Nevat. Yeravam ben Nevat was the first king of the ten tribes. And he didn't want the ten tribes to go to Yerushalayim to the Beis HaMikdash, so he actually put guards on the roads to prevent people from going to the Beis HaMikdash. And he actually built golden calves, Egle Zahav, in Beisel in Shomron, which was the capital of the Northern Kingdom. And Yerevan ben Nevat is the prototype of not only the Chote, not only the sinner, which is bad enough, but Machti, the one who causes other people to sin. That's the worst thing of all, because it's not just you, you're causing other people to sin. So, by the way, Yerevan ben Nevat started off as a tzaddik, by the way. And in fact, Yerevan ben Nevat became king, Alpiya Navi, Achia Hashiloni, one of the great Nevi'im, anointed Yerevan ben Nevat, Alpi Hashem, to be a melech. Now, obviously, if Yerevan was anointed by a Navi of Hashem, he must have been a very righteous person at the time. Okay, we shouldn't just look at him as some bum like uh, who led a rebellion. He was a navi. He, I mean, he was given this position, Al Pi Hakadosh Baruch and he was anointed by a navi. But he became a kolkol. He became ruined. And it's interesting. The Gemara in Sanhedrin seems to say that the shayrish of why he got ruined was gaiva, arrogance. The old saying of Lord Acton, British political philosopher, power corrupts, absolute power corrupts absolutely. Yerevam's power went to his head. The Gemara says, a fascinating story, that a Kodesh Baruch Hu said to Yerevam ben Nevat, Yerevam do tshuva, and then you and I and David ben Yishai will walk together in Olam Haba. You, I, David, we'll be a group, we'll be tight. Hashem says this. So Yerevam asks, who's going to be at the head of the line? Meaning, who's going to be number one in the group? So Hashem said, well, David, you know, David's a little better than you. Yerevam said, I don't want it. <laughs> Some of the Bali Musr said that when he says who's going to be at the head, he was asking, is, he was even attacking God. Are you going to be at the head? I don't even want Hashem to be at the head, head of it. Okay, but the Pashat Shad is he... No, Hashem, he'll give Hashem the number one position, but uh, David should not be ahead of him. So you see, this is the, this is the gaiva, how the gaiva can destroy a person. Again, and we see this 
over and over and over again that uh, you can have a person of greatness. I mean, we saw this with Korach. We saw this with Bilam. Again, this is a, almost a repeating theme among people who had a tremendous greatness in many ways. And it was the Gaiva that destroyed him. But be it as it may, Yeruvah ben Nevad is the prototype, right? Moshe is the biggest Sadik, and Yeruvah ben Nevad is the biggest Raja. And the Rambam seems to say, snap your fingers, you can be Moshe, or you could be, you could be Yeruvah. Now, just as an aside, Rav Hanan Wasserman, Hashem uh, Yinkam Damai, asks the question, how could the Rambam say, I could be as great as Moshe? I mean, isn't that a little hyperbolic? I mean, you could say, every person could be a tzaddik, okay, Baruch Hashem, that is the case. Every person could be Moshe Rabbeinu. Moshe Rabbeinu, the greatest of the Nevi'im. And the Torah itself says there will never be a Navi as great as Moshe. How could I be as great as Moshe Rabbeinu? So Rabbi Chanan Vashman says a very good yesite. In the beginning of Sefer Yoshua, when it says that Moshe, the Eved of Hashem, died, and Hashem spoke to Yoshua, so the Radak, Rabbi David Kimchi, one of the great Rishainim, who wrote on uh, Sfarim on, on Nach, by the way, the whole Kimchi family were great biblical interpreters. In fact, uh, the Ramban uh, very much admired the commentaries of the Kimchi family on uh, Nach, and he applied the aphorism, Emein Kemach Ein Torah. Perki Abba says, if there's no flower, there's no Torah. He applied it to the Kimchi family. Without the Kimchis, you know, we don't understand the, the Torah. But this is the Radak. So the Radak is I made on the idea, why is Moshe called Evet Hashem? What is the significance of being a servant of God? So the Radak says very beautifully that one of the halachas of being an Evet is Masha Kona Eved Kona Rabbi. Whatever an Eved acquires belongs to his master. If an Eved finds a hundred dollars, if an Eved finds a diamond ring, now granted, he could hide it, you know, no one's going to know, but according to the halacha, that hundred dollars, that diamond ring, belongs to the master. The, the definition of being an Eved is everything you own belongs to your master. Maishu Rabbeinu was a man of tremendous abilities. But every single koach he had, he gave to the service of Hashem. That is what it means to be an Eved Hashem. Ma, this is the Radak. Maishu Kona Eved, Kona Rabbi, Maishu was Eved Hashem. Ah, so now Rabbi Hanan says, a Gavalda Gipshat. Rabbi Hanan says, when the Rambam says every person could be as righteous as Maishu Rabbeinu, that doesn't mean any of us could ever achieve the level of Maishu Rabbeinu. But that's not our responsibility. Every person is judged, not in an objective way. Every person is judged based on how much of your potential, how much of your talents did you give to God? So let's just quantify it. I mean, this is a meaningless example, but let's go. let's imagine Maishu Rabbeinu had a tank, I mean, it makes no sense, had a tank of one million gallons. And let's assume our tank is 10 gallons. Maishu Rabbeinu gave Hashem one million gallons. I don't have a million gallons to give. But if I give 10 gallons to Hashem, I'm giving Hashem 100% of what I am, I'm like Moshe Rabbeinu. Because even though he gave, you know, a million times more or whatever, a hundred thousand times more than me or whatever. Again, I'm, I'm, these are meaningless numbers, but I'm just illustrating the idea. So you're judged not based on how much you objectively accomplished in life, but you're judged by how much of your potential did you give to Hashem. And in that way, I can be as much of an Evet Hashem as my Shurabeinu. Because I give Hashem my 10 gallons, he gave Hashem his million gallons. I'm an Eved Hashem too. Masha Kana Eved Kana Rabbi. The Mabit, Rav Maisha ben Yosef Trani, Trani is a, was a city in Italy, but the Mabit uh, lived in Svat. He was 
the head of the basin in the time of Rabbi Yosef Cairo. Rabbi Yosef Cairo was the Rav, the Mabit was the Av Basin. Uh, I'm not sure, as sometimes they had a bit of a stormy relationship, but particularly, particularly about Shemitah, they had big, big machlokim. At one point, Rabbi Yosef Cairo threatened to put the Mabit in Cherem, but okay. Uh, interesting story, but they both were great, great, great Gedole Torah. And in addition to the halachic works of the Mabit, Shuvos Mabit, uh, he also wrote a book on Jewish philosophy that's called Beis Elokim. It's a very, very, very fine uh, book. It's not, unfortunately, it's not uh, learned as much today, but it's a very Yisaitistic book in many ways. It's never been translated, the Beis Elokim. And in the Hakdama to the Beis Elokim, he quotes a Gemara. The Gemara talks about the son of Rabbi Yeshua ben Levi, who was very ill and apparently died, had kind of a near-death experience or an actual death experience. And when he was revived, he actually described his soul going up to Shemayim. And his father asked him, what did you see in Shemayim, in Gan Eden? So he said, I saw a topsy-turvy world, Olam Hafuch. El Yonim, the people that are high and mighty in this world, Lamata, they were inferior in that world. Tachtonim, and those who are insignificant in this world, Lamala, they were all the way up. I couldn't believe it. Everything was opposite of what I see in this world. Rabbi Shua ben Levi told him, that's not a topsy-turvy world. That's a true world. You saw an MS sticker world. This world, we're wa walking upside down. This world is topsy-turvy. You saw the truth. This is a Gemara. So the Mabit says, what does he mean by those who were high in this world were low in that world? If high just meant rich and powerful, then what's the Hava mean? Why, 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 is the, why is the boy even surprised? Why would you assume that just because somebody's a mil I mean, I give a a millionaire can also be a Balstaka, but just because he's a millionaire, why would that count? Meaning, what is the plea in this reversal? So says the Ma'abit, Gavaldik Abshat, El Yainim, Big Shots, does not mean rich or powerful. It means people who accomplished more in the spiritual realm. Let's imagine you have two guys. One guy is like a real genius, and he can learn a hundred blot of Gemara a day. That's pretty good. So he decides he'll only learn 50 blot of Gemara a day, which is also pretty good. Pretty, pretty good. So what's going on? So two guys. One guy learns 50 blot of Gemara a day. And the other guy struggles to get through an omit a week. He's not good in vocabulary, hard difficulty, but he really pushes himself. Right? So we look at these two people and we say, wow, this guy is such a Talmud Chacham, such a Lamdan. And the other guy we have kind of pity. Okay, well, he tries hard, but you know, what, what can you do? He's not really accomplishing anything. We come to Olam Haba. And these two fellows are standing before Hashem in judgment. And the guy who did 50 blood a day, you know, understandably feels pretty proud of his accomplishments. The guy who does an Amid a week is going to get more Olam Haba. Because the guy who did an Amid a week gave Hashem 100% of his abilities. And the guy who did 50 blood, although that's a tremendous thing, only gave Hashem 50% of his abilities. So this is what was a surprise. In other words, I'm looking in this world and I see a person who was a lamdan, a Talmud Chacham, who accomplished so much in his learning. And then I look at this other guy who didn't seem to learn that much at all. And yet in Olam Haba, he's higher. See, that's the Chiddush. And Rabbi Shua ben Levi says, huh, that's not a Chiddush. That's the way things really are. You know, in school, good-hearted teachers like to tell you, you know, the only, the only important thing is your efforts, and as long as you try your best. But you know, 
you're not going to get an A with that. You know, uh, the guy, the guy that's smart and knows the stuff is going to get an A, and you'll get an F with a pat on your head. You know, uh, it's really nice that you tried. So we, we do give lip service to it, and it's Baruch Hashem. It's good that we do give lip service to it because it's important to at least acknowledge effort. But the truth is, in this world, even in Limudei Kodesh, even in learning of Torah, we don't really treat effort with the ultimate respect that it deserves. But there's one place, which is the most important place, where effort is indeed what really counts. And that is in Shemayim, which is the ultimate judgment. And therefore, going back to Rabbi Chun and Wasserman, by the way, just as an aside, um, this is from the Mabit. The Mabit lived in the 1500s. Interesting, someone showed me that Rav Moshe Feinstein uh, was machab. I guess he, he doesn't quote the Mabit, but he said it on his own. So it's saying that Rav Moshe came up with the very same explanation of that Gemara as the Mabit had said. So this is really an example that there are many hidden nuggets uh, in the Mabit that people often, even, even the Gadol, uh, often don't encounter. But the Mabit is a very interesting safer to, uh, to look at. Okay, so going back to Rav Ochana, so when the Rambam says each person can be as big a tzaddik as Maisha Rabbeinu, it refers to becoming an Evet Hashem. Maisha gave everything that he had to Hashem. We can also give everything we have to Hashem. And in Hashem's book, that makes us equal to Moshe. Now, what that means exactly is not so simple. I mean... Uh, what does that mean exactly? Does that mean that someone who gave 100% with very limited talents and abilities is going to be the same as Moshe Rabbeinu? That's kind of a little odd. Uh, they'll have the same Kirvas Avokim. So maybe we'll talk about that a little later. Uh, I mean, by, almost by definition, it wouldn't be Shaykh for that lesser Neshama to have the same Devekas to Hashem. I mean, you can only get as much as you can get. But I think what it might mean is you'll have no sense of missing something. Because I'll talk about the idea that when we don't live by our potential and we get sechar, we always have a sense that we're missing something. So for the person who gave Hashem all, he's not going to have the same thing that Moshe Rabbeinu has. But he's not going to feel that he's missing something. It's kind of that psychological thing. Of course, it's a little strange to talk about the psychological feelings of a neshama. And that's, <laughs> that's how we're using all sorts of strange words uh, to describe that process. But that's how I understand it. Meaning it's not shy he's going to get the same measure of Tavekas. He's going to get less because he is less. But he will not have any sense of loss. By the way, that's another question that bothers me. Uh, sense of loss, that's a very strange thing. Uh, the reward of Olam Haba is eternal. So does that mean, I mean, that kind of takes away some of the reward here. That means eternally, I'm always going to feel I was I'm missing something. And that's uh, also a very strange thing. Like, what type of eternal reward is it? <laughs> that's for eternity, we're going to feel a sense that I didn't do as well as I could have done. A little, that's a little strange. So there too, perhaps, there's a temporary state you go through, and but I don't know. Okay, well, we'll talk about it a little bit more. But this is what I wanted to share with you, uh, Rabbi Chanan Wasserman's pshat, that each person could be a tzaddik like Moshe Rabbeinu. Uh, just one, uh, one more minute. Uh, t uh, this Moshe Shabbos, uh, we start slichos. This is the Yomim Narayim season. Uh, officially starts. Actually, it'll. When did it officially start? It was Oslander said it officially started after Ne'ilah, last Yom Kippur, is when you start preparing uh, for Rosh Hashanah. So it started a year ago, almost a year ago. But uh, one really gets into the Amin Ram Slichas. Um, Rabbi Wiener wanted me to talk about Slichas. Um, the truth is, on Motzei Shabbos, I will be talking about Slichas in the base measure. So uh, what I have to say will be there. Uh, but uh, one point I just want to make with you, uh, and that is... Uh, the most important part of Selichos is the reiteration over and over again, the recitation of the 13 attributes of mercy, which is what Hashem taught Moshe Rabbeinu after the Chet Egel. And the Gemara in Rosh Hashanah 
quotes Hashem is telling Moshe Rabbeinu, Kishayasu banecha keseder hazeh. When your children do this order, this order of the Yud Gemomidas of Rachamim, it's ma'orer, it will arouse mercy from above. So it's interesting, most understand that, most understand that to mean when you recite the Yud Gemomidas of Rachamim. But they say, B'Shem the Shalah, that you'll notice it doesn't say, Kishayamru banecha, it doesn't say when your children say it, but it says, when your children do it, kishiyasu. And what that actually means is, what brings the mercy down from heaven is not simply saying these midas of rachamim, but to try to live them in the behavior that we show each other. Uh, there's a beautiful, beautiful sefer, again, written by Rav Moshe Cordovero, who was the, again, in the time of the Beis Yosef and the Mabit, uh, he was in Sfat at that time. Uh, he was the head Kabbalist uh, before the Arizal. The Arizal succeeded him, kind of. Moshe Gadever also died very young, I think at 48. The Arizal died at 38. Uh, but Moshe Gadever was a great, great Makobo, and he wrote many, many Svarim. But one of these Svarim that uh, is Kabbalistic, but it's a light Kabbalah that you know, most people are able to get something out of, is the beautiful, lovely sefer called Timer Devaira. And Timer Devaira is a manual that actually says, how do you apply the Yud Gimel Midas of Rachamim to your behavior? Meaning, the concept is, the way I behave is the way Hashem will behave towards me. So therefore, each Mida is given a definition so you will bring down that particular Sheva. So maybe next week, maybe we'll talk a little bit about uh, the Yud Gimel Midas of Rachamim and uh, uh, what the Tarmid Devarah says about different things. Okay.